Section 5 of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 4, Lectures. Dresden Edition, published 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 4. A Thanksgiving Sermon, Part 1 Many ages ago, our fathers were living in dens and caves. Their bodies, their low foreheads, were covered with hair. They were eating berries, roots, bark, and vermin. They were fond of snakes and raw fish. They discovered fire and, probably by accident, learned how to cause it by friction. They found how to warm themselves to fight the frost and storm. They fashioned clubs and rude weapons of stone with which they killed the larger beasts and now and then each other. Slowly, painfully, almost imperceptibly, they advanced. They crawled and stumbled, staggered and struggled toward the light. To them the world was unknown. On every hand was the mysterious, the sinister, the hurtful. The forests were filled with monsters, and the darkness was crowded with ghosts, devils, and fiendish gods. These poor wretches were the slaves of fear, the sport of dreams. Now and then one rose a little above his fellows, used his senses, the little reason that he had, found something new, some better way. Then the people killed him, and afterward knelt with reverence at his grave. Then another thinker gave his thought, was murdered. Another tomb became sacred. Another step was taken in advance. And so, through countless years of ignorance and cruelty, of thought and crime, of murder and worship, of heroism, suffering, and self-denial, the race has reached the heights where now we stand. Looking back over the long and devious roads that lie between the barbarism of the past and the civilization of today, thinking of the centuries that rolled like waves between these distant shores, we can form some idea of what our fathers suffered, of the mistakes they made, some idea of their ignorance, their stupidity, and some idea of their sense, their goodness, their heroism. It is a long road from the savage to the scientist, from a den to a mansion, from leaves to clothes, from a flickering rush to the arc light, from a hammer of stone to the modern mill, a long distance from the pipe of pan to the violin, to the orchestra, from a floating log to a steamship, from a sickle to a reaper, from a flail to a threshing machine, from a crooked stick to a plow from a spinning wheel to a spinning jenny, from a hand loom to a jacquard, a jacquard that weaves fair forms and wondrous flowers beyond Arachne's utmost dream, from a few hieroglyphics on the skins of beasts, on bricks of clay, to a printing press, to a library, a long distance from the messenger traveling on foot to the electric spark, from knives and tools of stone to those of steel, a long distance from sand to telescopes, from echo to the phonograph, the phonograph that buries in indented lines and dots the sounds of living speech, and then gives back to life the very words and voices of the dead, a long way from the trumpet to the telephone, the telephone that transports speech as swift as thought and drops the words, perfect as minted coins, in listening ears, a long way from a fallen tree to the suspension bridge, from the dried sinews of beasts to the cables of steel, from the oar to the propeller, from the sling to the rifle, from the catapult to the cannon, a long distance from revenge to law, from the club to the legislature, from slavery to freedom, from appearance to fact, from fear to reason. 
and yet the distance has been traveled by the human race countless obstructions have been overcome numberless enemies have been conquered thousands and thousands of victories have been won for the right and millions have lived labored and died for their fellow men for the blessings we enjoy for the happiness that is ours we ought to be grateful our hearts should blossom with thankfulness whom what should we thank let us be honest generous should we thank the church christianity has controlled christendom for at least fifteen hundred years during these centuries what have the orthodox churches accomplished for the good of man in this life man needs raiment and roof food and fuel he must be protected from heat and cold from snow and storm he must take thought for the morrow in the summer of youth he must prepare for the winter of age he must know something of the causes of disease of the conditions of health if possible he must conquer pain increase happiness and lengthen life he must supply the wants of the body and feed the hunger of the mind what good has the church done has it taught men to cultivate the earth to build homes to weave cloth to cure or prevent disease to build ships to navigate the seas to conquer pain or to lengthen life did christ or any of his apostles add to the sum of useful knowledge did they say one word in favor of any science of any art did they teach their fellow men how to make a living how to overcome the obstructions of nature how to prevent sickness how to protect themselves from pain from famine from misery and rags did they explain any of the phenomena of nature any of the facts that affect the life of man did they say anything in favor of investigation of study of thought did they teach the gospel of self-reliance of industry of honest effort can any farmer mechanic or scientist find in the new testament one useful fact is there anything in the sacred book that can help the geologist the astronomer the biologist the physician the inventor the manufacturer of any useful thing what has the church done from the very first it taught the vanity the worthlessness of all earthly things it taught the wickedness of wealth the blessedness of poverty it taught that the business of this life was to prepare for death it insisted that a certain belief was necessary to ensure salvation and that all who failed to believe or doubted in the least would suffer eternal pain according to the church the natural desires ambitions and passions of man were all wicked and depraved to love god to practice self-denial to overcome desire to despise wealth to hate prosperity to desert wife and children to live on roots and berries to repeat prayers to wear rags to live in filth to drive love from the heart these for centuries were the highest and most perfect virtues and those who practiced them were saints the saints did not assist their fellow men their fellow men assisted them they did not labor for others they were beggars parasites vermin they were insane they followed the teachings of christ they took no thought for the morrow they mutilated their bodies scarred their flesh and destroyed their minds for the sake of happiness in another world during the journey of life they kept their eyes on the grave they gathered no flowers by the way they walked in the dust of the road avoided the green fields their moans made all the music they wished to hear the babble of brooks the songs of birds the laughter of children were nothing to them pleasure was the child of sin and the happy needed a change of heart they were sinless and miserable but they had faith they were pious and wretched but they were limping towards heaven what has the church done it has denounced pride and luxury all things that adorn and enrich life all the pleasures of sense the ecstasies of love 
the happiness of the hearth the clasp and kiss of wife and child and the church has done this because it regarded this life as a period of probation a time to prepare to become spiritual to overcome the natural to fix the affections on the invisible to become passionless to subdue the flesh to congeal the blood to fold the wings of fancy to become dead to the world so that when you appeared before god you would be the exact opposite of what he made you what has the church done it pretended to have a revelation from god it knew the road to eternal joy the way to death it preached salvation by faith and declared that only orthodox believers could become angels and all doubters would be damned it knew this and so knowing it became the enemy of discussion of investigation of thought why investigate why discuss why think when you know it sought to enslave the world it appealed to force it unsheathed the sword lighted the faggot forged the chain built the dungeon erected the scaffold invented and used the instruments of torture it branded maimed and mutilated it imprisoned and tortured it blinded and burned hanged and crucified and utterly destroyed millions and millions of human beings it touched every nerve of the body produced every pain that can be felt every agony that can be endured and it did all this to preserve what it called the truth to destroy heresy and doubt and to save if possible the souls of a few it was honest it was necessary to prevent the development of the brain to arrest all progress and to do this the church used all its power if men were allowed to think and express their thoughts they would fill their minds and the minds of others with doubts if they were allowed to think they would investigate and then they might contradict the creed dispute the words of priests and defy the church the priests cried to the people it is for us to talk it is for you to hear our duty is to preach and yours is to believe what has the church done there have been thousands of councils and synods thousands and thousands of occasions when the clergy have met and discussed and quarreled when pope and cardinals bishops and priests have added to or explained their creeds and denied the rights of others what useful truth did they discover what fact did they find did they add to the intellectual wealth of the world did they increase the sum of knowledge i admit that they looked over a number of jewish books and picked out the ones that jehovah wrote did they find the medicinal virtue that dwells in any weed or flower i know that they decided that the holy ghost was not created not begotten but that he proceeded did they teach us the mysteries of the metals and how to purify the ores in furnace flames they shouted great is the mystery of godliness did they show us how to improve our condition in this world they informed us that christ has two natures and two wills did they give us even a hint as to any useful thing they gave us predestination foreordination and just enough free will to go to hell did they discover or show us how to produce anything for food did they produce anything to satisfy the hunger of man instead of this they discovered that a peasant girl who lived in palestine was the mother of god this they proved by a book and to make the book evidence they called it inspired did they tell us anything about chemistry how to combine and separate substances how to subtract the hurtful how to produce the useful they told us that bread by making certain motions and mumbling certain prayers would be changed into the flesh of god and that in the same way wine could be changed to his blood and this notwithstanding the fact that god never had any flesh or blood but has always been a spirit without body parts or passions what has the church done it gave us the history of the world of the stars and the beginnings of all things it taught the geology of moses 
the astronomy of joshua and elijah it taught the fall of man and the atonement proved that a jewish peasant was god established the existence of hell purgatory and heaven it pretended to have a revelation from god the scriptures in which could be found all knowledge everything that man could need in the journey of life nothing outside of the inspired book except legends and prayers could be of any value books that contradicted the bible were hurtful those that agreed with it useless nothing was of importance except faith credulity belief the church said let philosophy alone count your beads ask no questions fall upon your knees shut your eyes and save your souls what has the church done for centuries it kept the earth flat for centuries it made all the hosts of heaven travel around this world for centuries it clung to sacred knowledge and fought facts with the ferocity of a fiend for centuries it hated the useful it was the deadly enemy of medicine disease was produced by devils and could be cured only by priests decaying bones and holy water doctors were the rivals of priests they diverted the revenues the church opposed the study of anatomy was against the dissection of the dead man had no right to cure disease god would do that through his priests man had no right to prevent disease diseases were sent by god as judgments the church opposed inoculation vaccination and the use of chloroform and ether it was declared to be a sin a crime for a woman to lessen the pangs of motherhood the church declared that woman must bear the curse of the merciful jehovah what has the church done it taught that the insane were inhabited by devils insanity was not a disease it was produced by demons it could be cured by prayers gifts amulets and charms all these had to be paid for this enriched the church these ideas were honestly entertained by protestants as well as catholics by luther calvin knox and wesley what has the church done it taught the awful doctrine of witchcraft it filled the darkness with demons the air with devils and the world with grief and shame it charged men women and children with being in league with satan to injure their fellows old women were convicted for causing storms at sea for preventing rain and for bringing frost girls were convicted for having changed themselves into wolves snakes and toads these witches were burned for causing diseases for selling their souls and for souring beer all these things were done with the aid of the devil who sought to persecute the faithful the lambs of god satan sought in many ways to scandalize the church he sometimes assumed the appearance of a priest and committed crimes on one occasion he personated a bishop a bishop renowned for his sanctity allowed himself to be discovered and dragged from the room of a beautiful widow so perfectly did he counterfeit the features and form of the bishop that many who were well acquainted with the prelate were actually deceived and the widow herself thought her lover was the bishop all this was done by the devil to bring reproach upon holy men hundreds of like instances could be given as the war waged between demons and priests was long and bitter these popes and priests these clergymen were not hypocrites they believed in the new testament in the teachings of christ and they knew that the principal business of the savior was casting out devils what has the church done it made the wife a slave the property of the husband and it placed the husband as much above the wife as christ was above the husband it taught that a nun is purer nobler than a mother it induced millions of pure and conscientious girls to renounce the joys of life to take the veil woven of night and death to wear the habiliments of the dead made them believe that they were the brides of christ for my part i would as soon be a widow as the bride of a man who had been dead for eighteen hundred years the poor deluded girls imagined that they in some mysterious way were in spiritual wedlock united with god all worldly desires were driven from their hearts 
they filled their lives with fastings with prayers with self-accusings they forgot fathers and mothers and gave their love to the invisible they were the victims the convicts of superstition prisoners in the penitentiaries of god conscientious good sincere insane these loving women gave their hearts to a phantom their lives to a dream a few years ago at a revival a fine buxom girl was converted born again in her excitement she cried i'm married to christ i'm married to christ in her delirium she threw her arms around the neck of an old man and again cried i'm married to christ the old man who happened to be a kind of skeptic gently removed her hands saying at the same time i don't know much about your husband but i have great respect for your father-in-law priests theologians have taken advantage of women of their gentleness their love of approbation they have lived upon their hopes and fears like vampires they have sucked their blood they have made them responsible for the sins of the world they have taught them the slave virtues meekness humility implicit obedience they have fed their minds with mistakes mysteries and absurdities they have endeavored to weaken and shrivel their brains until to them there would be no possible connection between evidence and belief between fact and faith what has the church done it was the enemy of commerce of business it denounced the taking of interest for money without taking interest for money progress is impossible the steamships the great factories the railroads have all been built with borrowed money money on which interest was promised and for the most part paid the church was opposed to fire insurance to life insurance it denounced insurance in any form as gambling as immoral to insure your life was to declare that you had no confidence in god that you relied on a corporation instead of divine providence it was declared that god would provide for your widow and your fatherless children to insure your life was to insult heaven what has the church done the church regarded epidemics as the messengers of the good god the black death was sent by the eternal father whose mercy spared some and whose justice murdered the rest to stop the scourge they tried to soften the heart of god by kneelings and prostrations by processions and prayers by burning incense and by making vows they did not try to remove the cause the cause was god they did not ask for pure water but for holy water faith and filth lived or rather died together religion and rags piety and pollution kept company sanctity kept its odor what has the church done it was the enemy of art and literature it destroyed the marbles of greece and rome beauty was pagan it destroyed so far as it could the best literature of the world it feared thought but it preserved the scriptures the ravings of insane saints the falsehoods of the fathers the bulls of popes the accounts of miracles performed by shrines by dried blood and faded hair by pieces of bones and wood by rusty nails and thorns by handkerchiefs and rags by water and beads and by a finger of the holy ghost this was the literature of the church i admit that the priests were honest as honest as ignorant more could not be said what has the church done christianity claims with great pride that it established asylums for the insane yes it did but the insane were treated as criminals they were regarded as the homes as the tenement houses of devils they were persecuted and tormented they were chained and flogged starved and killed the asylums were prisons dungeons the insane were victims and the keepers were ignorant conscientious pious fiends they were not trying to help men they were fighting devils destroying demons they were not actuated by love but by hate and fear what has the church done it founded schools where facts were denied where science was denounced and philosophy despised schools where priests were made 
where they were taught to hate reason and to look upon doubts as the suggestions of the devil schools where the heart was hardened and the brain shriveled schools in which lies were sacred and truths profane schools for the more general diffusion of ignorance schools to prevent thought to suppress knowledge schools for the purpose of enslaving the world schools in which teachers knew less than pupils what has the church done it has used its influence with god to get rain and sunshine to stop flood and storm to kill insects rats snakes and wild beasts to stay pestilence and famine to delay frost and snow to lengthen the lives of kings and queens to protect presidents to give legislators wisdom to increase collections and subscriptions in marriages it has made god the party of the third part it has sprinkled water on babes when they are named it has put oil on the dying and repeated prayers for the dead it has tried to protect the people from the malice of the devil from ghosts and spooks from witches and wizards and all the leering fiends that seek to poison the souls of men it has endeavored to protect the sheep of god from the wolves of science from the wild beasts of doubt and investigation it has tried to wean the lambs of the lord from the delights the pleasures the joys of life according to the philosophy of the church the virtuous weep and suffer the vicious laugh and thrive the good carry a cross and the wicked fly but in the next life this will be reversed then the good will be happy and the bad will be damned the church filled the world with faith and crime it polluted the fountains of joy it gave us an ignorant jealous revengeful and cruel god sometimes merciful sometimes ferocious now just now infamous sometimes wise generally foolish it gave us a devil cunning malicious almost the equal of god not quite as strong but quicker not as profound but sharper it gave us angels with wings cherubim and seraphim and a heaven with harps and hallelujahs with streets of gold and gates of pearl it gave us fiends and imps with wings like bats it gave us ghosts and goblins spooks and sprites and little devils that swarmed in the bodies of men and it gave us hell where the souls of men will roast in eternal flames shall we thank the church shall we thank the orthodox churches shall we thank them for the hell they made here shall we thank them for the hell of the future we must remember that the church was founded and has been protected by god that all the popes and cardinals all the bishops priests and monks all the ministers and exhorters were selected and set apart all sanctified and enlightened by the infinite god that the holy scriptures were inspired by the same being and that all the orthodox creeds were really made by him we know what these men filled with the holy ghost have done we know the part they have played we know the souls they have saved and the bodies they have destroyed we know the consolation they have given and the pain they have inflicted the lies they have defended the truths they have denied we know that they convinced millions that celibacy is the greatest of all virtues that women are perpetual temptations the enemies of true holiness that monks and priests are nobler than fathers that nuns are purer than mothers we know that they taught the blessed absurdity of the trinity that god once worked at the trade of a carpenter in palestine we know that they divided knowledge into sacred and profane taught that revelation was sacred that reason was blasphemous that faith was holy and facts false that the sin of adam and eve brought disease and pain vice and death into the world we know that they have taught the dogma of special providence that all events are ordered and regulated by god that he crowns and uncrowns kings preserves and destroys guards and kills that it is the duty of man to submit to the divine will and that no matter how much evil there may be no matter how much suffering how much pain and death man should pour out his heart in thankfulness that it is no worse let me be understood i do not say and i do not think that the church was dishonest that the clergy were insincere i admit that all religions all creeds 
all priests have been naturally produced i admit and cheerfully admit that the believers in the supernatural have done some good not because they believed in gods and devils but in spite of it i know that thousands and thousands of clergymen are honest self-denying and humane that they are doing what they believe to be their duty doing what they can to induce men and women to live pure and noble lives this is not the result of their creeds it is because they are human what i say is that every honest teacher of the supernatural has been and is an unconscious enemy of the human race what is the philosophy of the church of those who believe in the supernatural back of all that is back of all events christians have put an infinite juggler who with a wish creates preserves destroys the world is his stage and mankind his puppets he fills them with wants and desires with appetites and ambitions with hopes and fears with love and hate he touches the springs he pulls the strings baits the hooks sets the traps and digs the pits the play is a continuous performance he watches these puppets as they struggle and fail sees them outwit each other and themselves leads them to every crime watches the births and deaths hears lullabies at cradles and the fall of clods on coffins he has no pity he enjoys the tragedies the desperation the despair the suicides he smiles at the murders the assassinations the seductions the desertions the abandoned babes of shame he sees the weak enslaved mothers robbed of babes the innocent in dungeons on scaffolds he sees crime crowned and hypocrisy robed he withholds the rain and his puppets starve he opens the earth and they are devoured he sends the flood and they are drowned he empties the volcano and they perish in fire he sends the cyclone and they are torn and mangled with quick lightnings they are dashed to death he fills the air and water with the invisible enemies of life the messengers of pain and watches the puppets as they breathe and drink he creates cancers to feed upon their flesh their quivering nerves serpents to fill their veins with venom beasts to crunch their bones to lap their blood some of the poor puppets he makes insane makes them struggle in the darkness with imagined monsters with glaring eyes and dripping jaws and some are made without the flame of thought to drool and drivel through the darkened days he sees all the agony the injustice the rags of poverty the withered hands of want the motherless babes the deformed the maimed the leprous knows the tears that flow hears the sobs and moans sees the gleam of swords hears the roar of the guns sees the fields reddened with blood the white faces of the dead but he mocks when their fear cometh and at their calamity he fills the heavens with laughter and the poor puppets who are left alive fall on their knees and thank the juggler with all their hearts but after all the gods have not supported the children of men men have supported the gods they have built the temples they have sacrificed their babes their lambs their cattle they have drenched the altars with blood they have given their silver their gold their gems they have fed and clothed their priests but the gods have given nothing in return hidden in the shadows they have answered no prayer heard no cry given no sign extended no hand uttered no word unseen and unheard they have sat on their thrones deaf and dumb paralyzed and blind in vain the steeples rise in vain the prayers ascend and think what man has done to please the gods he has renounced his reason extinguished the torch of his brain he has believed without evidence and against evidence he has slandered and maligned himself he has fasted and starved he has mutilated his body scarred his flesh given his blood to vermin he has persecuted imprisoned and destroyed his fellows he has deserted wife and child he has lived alone in the desert he has swung censers and burned incense 
counted beads, and sprinkled himself with holy water, shut his eyes, clasped his hands, fallen upon his knees, and groveled in the dust. But the gods have been silent, silent as stones. Have these cringing and crawlings, these cruelties and absurdities, this faith and foolishness pleased the gods? We do not know. Has any disaster been averted, any blessing obtained? We do not know. Shall we thank these gods? Shall we thank the church's god? Who and what is he? They say that he is the creator and preserver of all that has been, of all that is, of all that will be, that he is the father of angels and devils, the architect of heaven and hell, that he made the earth, a man and woman, that he made the serpent who tempted them, made his own rival, gave victory to his enemy, that he repented of what he had done, that he sent a flood and destroyed all of the children of men with the exception of eight persons, that he tried to civilize the survivors and their children, tried to do this with earthquakes and fiery serpents, with pestilence and famine. But he failed. He intended to fail. Then he was born into the world, preached for three years, and allowed some savages to kill him. Then he rose from the dead and went back to heaven. He knew that he would fail, knew that he would be killed. In fact, he arranged everything himself and brought everything to pass, just as he had predestined it an eternity before the world was. All who believe these things will be saved, and they who doubt or deny will be lost. Has this God good sense? not always he creates his own enemies and plots against himself nothing lives except in accordance with his will and yet the devils do not die what is the matter with this god well sometimes he is foolish sometimes he is cruel and sometimes he is insane does this god exist is there any intelligence back of nature is there any being anywhere among the stars who pities the suffering children of men? We do not know. Shall we thank nature? Does nature care for us more than for leaves or grass or flies? Does nature know that we exist? We do not know. But we do know that nature is going to murder us all. Why should we thank nature? If we thank God or nature for the sunshine and rain, for health and happiness, whom shall we curse for famine and pestilence, for earthquake and cyclone, for disease and death? End of part one of a Thanksgiving sermon by Robert G. Ingersoll.